Welcome everyone to The Watch List, Australia's newest investor-focused webinar series for ASX listed companies to pitch to real investors and be added to their watch lists. I know each of you carefully curates your own investment watch list. Some of the companies on there you have invested in and some of the companies are on there so you can keep an eye on them as potential investment opportunities. For companies, getting on your watch list is a big deal. It means they are being watched and have the chance to have you invest in them and follow their journey. The Watch List is a fortnightly webinar that has been designed to offer a broad mix of industry focus and company size to deliver the maximum opportunity for listed companies to tell their story and hopefully make that leap onto a few more investor watch lists. Today, we're bringing some companies who I'm sure are already on your watch list and some you may be considering adding. Presenting today are Azure Minerals, Dreadnought Resources, Phoenix Resources and Pursuit Minerals. Each company will present, then management will be on hand to answer any questions you have. So make sure you have questions ready of management and submit them using the Q&A box. Okay, let's get started. Our first presenter is Dean Tuck. Managing Director of Dreadnought Resources, ASX Code DRE. Dreadnought currently has four West Australian projects providing a diverse mix of geological terrains and target commodities while ensuring year-round news flow. Dean, over to you. Thank you, David. It's a great initiative by you guys and uh, great to see some of the companies here, especially uh, Azure and Phoenix are on my watch list. I've watched them for a while, so great to see them kicking goals. So I'll try and keep this short so we can make time for questions. So we'll, uh, we're dreadnoughts and, and we'll give this a quick chat. We'll, next slide. And we'll breeze through the disclaimer to the next slide. All right, so dreadnought is a, is a brief overview. As David mentioned, we have four projects within Western Australia. Each of those projects is quite a, a large scale project. I think we have over close to 10,000 square kilometers of Western Australia under on ownership and exploration. And that's for a range of commodities. Uh, Dreadnought is an exploration company. We focus on boots on ground, making the discoveries and delivering those resources. And we've done quite a few of that over the, our, our very uh, few short years of existence. Delivered the Orion discovery in 2021, and we're in the midst of delivering a number of rare earth and niobium discoveries in the Mangaroom project area, and about to embark on additional exploration and discovery processes across our gold at Mangaroon, our nickel at Mangaroon with first quantum, and, uh, and of course, back up to the Kimberley with some more copper and gold discoveries hopefully to be made. Uh, we're led by, by Paul Chapman, Philip Crutchfield, Robert G, and we just added Debbie Fullerton uh, as our chief financial officer. We have a, a very well-invested company. We have board and management have put in close to $5 million of our own cold hard cash into the company to date, and we control about 15%. So we are certainly here to deliver shareholder returns uh, through value creation by making discoveries and then finding the best ways to commercialize those discoveries uh, to return money to shareholders. We'll move on to the next slide. I'll talk today a lot about Mangaroon. This is where a lot of our news flow is coming out of, and in particularly uh, where we have three rigs turning at the moment. Rare Earths uh, discovery that we made just over 12 months ago with our first drill holes into Yin, right next door to Hastings Yangabana operation, which is going into development. Uh, the entrance to their mine sits on our tenements. So to say we're neighbors is a bit of an understatement. And we also have in this region the carbonatites, which I'll talk more in detail on the next couple of slides. But before we move on, I want to talk about the gold. So we've consolidated the Star of Mangaroon, uh, the lead gold mine, Two Peaks. And we're very excited about the work that's going on in the background there with Sam Bassetti and Matt Crow out there as we speak. We actually have a diamond rig turning. Uh, twinning some of those holes historically. The place hasn't been drilled in 20, 30 years plus, and are really going to start getting our eyes in, generating targets for later this year, early next year, getting out there and doing some discoveries on the gold front. Um, the nickel, we have the first quantum joint venture. We have some very, well, five high conductor plates sitting there within the, uh, the money intrusion, and we'll be out there drilling those uh, very, very shortly. So we're very excited about the Mangaroon project. It's over 5,200 square kilometers. It takes us you know, two, three hours to drive from Yen up to, the, up to the nickel prospects. So it's a very large land package, a lot of opportunity here. So rare earth is what we're focusing on. We'll go on to the next slide. We start off in uh, 
and just over 12 months ago, we put our first drill holes into Yin, some of the thickest and highest grades rare earth mineralization this region had ever seen, which is quite significant considering that Hastings was going into development next door. We're probably the only rare earth player on the market that has a second mover advantage, and that's allowed us before we even drilled that first drill hole to know that we could produce a high quality monazite mineral concentrate, which is a very critical aspect of all rare earth projects before we even got stuck into it. So with the metallurgy confirmed before we started drilling, we were lined up and prepared to hit this thing pretty hard, which allowed us to put out our initial resource in six months. And we just put out our second resource update within 12 months of our first drill hole, which has given us 20 million tons of, of rare earth mineralization, including some high grade components within that. Again, the metallurgy that we continue to do continues to show the production of a high quality monazite concentrate at extremely high recoveries. Uh, I think that next door Hastings and Gabana is around 83, 85. To date, we've seen 85 to 93 percent recoveries. Uh, there's nothing like that globally. When you look at uh, a lot of the other main Gabana type resources around the world, you're looking at anywhere between 45 and, and 65 percent recoveries. And it's certainly a big selling point of this region. Uh, quality monazite, quality concentrates uh, production with good recoveries and a very high NDPR trio ratio which as we go into the global supply being dominated by neodymium and praseodymium, the higher ratio of neodymium and praseodymium in mineralization will become quite a significant selling point. Move on to the next slide. Stepping back out, you can see the yen resource there within the context of the wider Gifford Creek ferrocarbonatite complex. So you see Hastings resources and their ironstone scattered up there to the Northeast. The yen resource we delivered that 20 million tons our focus now is adding Y2 and a bit of mineralization to the north and mainly really converting that to indicated so that we can deliver our scoping studies into this year, a lot of additional met work and really underpin and prove the economics of the ironstone while Hastings is next door getting into production. With the ironstone set aside, we're doing a bit of exploration work, feeding back in what we've learned from all the drilling over the last 12 months. We have some IP crews out there, to see if we can start targeting some more uh, ironstones and also ground gravity crews. So we'll see what comes from that. So orientation geophysical work. And we're also going to be shifting our attention back towards our carbonatites where we've recently put out some good results. So in addition to the ironstones, which are similar to Hastings next door, we also have potentially the source carbonatite intrusions for the region, which sit down there at C1 to C5, which sits right on the Lions River Fault, so crustal scale structure, right where you expect to see carbonatites coming up and also just on our side of the 10 boundary, which is always very handy. The carbonatites uh, have a significant scale and grade opportunity. We're only at like 25 to 30 percent of our way through even just the first pass assessment of those carbonatites, and already we're seeing a high quality, thick and high grade rare earths, niobium, phosphate, titanium, and scandium mineralization, all the things you expect to see in a well endowed uh, carbonatite intrusive complex. Moving on to the next slide. So a bit of a close-up of the bit of drilling that we've done to date. So all those white dots you see on there are holes that have been planned and not yet drilled. And we'll be drilling those here in the very near future. We recently put out some infill drill results from C3, which is that CBRC 15 to 121. You can see they were getting 100 meters at over a percent, including nine meters at close to four and 25 at close to three. There's some quite good mineralization as we go in. That first pass wide space drilling, those white dots you see on there, those are 160 by 160 meter space drill holes, extremely wide space drilling. Um, one to two of those holes is designed to hit something like a mountain pass, which only has a 750 by 150 meter footprint. So it's very wide spaced. It's defined areas within the carbonatites where the mineralization sits, and we still have over 70% of that drilling to be taken. So there's a lot of upside opportunity here, and that's underscored by what we've seen at C5 in that last drill result, where we hit some quite uh, near surface, high grade niobium mineralization, and also some thick mineralization associated with that. So very excited to see what the rest of the carbonatites will, will deliver for us. We're delivering the rare earth ironstones, get that converted to indicators so we can put out the scoping study, prove the economics on the ironstones, which are next door to Hastings, and then get stuck into these carbonatites, stuck back into them, deliver that first pass drilling. On to the next slide. Looking at that, the C3 footprint is a good example of what we're trying to do. We do the first pass 160 by 160, come back in to an angled fence line of 80 meter spaced holes and try and find within that uh, anomalous zone 
areas of higher and thicker grade mineralization. So you see what we're seeing here is the supergene zone residual mineralization, which is quite common across all carbonatite complexes. That tends to be the first areas to get mined. It tends to be higher grade as a lot of the critical metals that we're searching for within these are resistate and they accumulate in that weathering zone. And then sitting beneath that tends to be uh, thicker and lower grade mineralization, like a lot of deposits around the world. Move on to the next slide. So upcoming catalysts for us, uh, we continue to drill on the rare earths. We have the two RC rigs there, the diamond rigs now on, over onto the gold mine to get our, get our eyes in for that as we continue to move on and prepare for the other commodities we'll be exploring for this year. We're preparing for the money intrusion, nickel PGE drilling. We've just completed that heritage survey and we'll be mobilizing out there as soon as we get everyone organized. And we have boots on ground at Central Yield Garden doing target generation work. We've got surface geophysical and geochemical crews out there uh, generating lithium and nickel targets. Come August, we'll be drilling on the gold, we're delivering our C3 uh, initial resource and start mobilizing up to the Kimberley to deliver the follow-up discovery drilling on the uh, Orion copper gold discovery. September, we'll be drilling away. We're getting results back. We'll be up boots on ground on Bresnahan, get into that target generation work on the heavy rare earths and gold and whatever else we find out there in that uh, fairly underexplored region. In October, November, December, continuing to explore across our other commodities, hoping to not only continue to deliver the indicated resources to underpin the studies on the rare earths, but additional discoveries on the copper and gold, the nickel, uh, and, and the gold and everything else we have sitting within our portfolio. Next slide. So takeaway message, uh, we're a very, very active explorer. We continue to deliver a track record of discoveries across a range of commodities. We have substantial projects. We're here to make these discoveries. We're here to deliver the resources, prove the economics, and then find the best way to commercialize those assets, either through partnership, joint venture, or outright sale of those assets, or bring them into production via some sort of spin out or other options there. We have an experienced management team. We're very well invested. We have $4.8 million invested to date, 15% of the shareholding. So you can be rest assured that any decisions that we make for this company is to deliver value and return money to our shareholders because we're shareholders ourselves. Dean, a great presentation as always. Now, I should have mentioned a uh, 14, 15 hour drive yesterday to get back from <laughs> site uh, to be here in time to talk to everyone today. So firstly, thanks for that. No worries, uh, a bit you, look very, yeah. you do look very sprightly uh, <laughs> considering the length of time you've been sitting in a car. Um, just come back from site. What's the mood? What, what's what, what's the, the feeling on site? Oh, morale's always up on site, so we're getting a fantastic results from the carbs, infill drilling on the iron stones, which is always exciting, seeing those thick intercepts out of Yen. Got our first diamond holes uh, being drilled in, so twinning historical holes at the Star of Mangaroon and seeing what comes out of that and doing all the boots on ground work and getting geared up for the second half of the year. I think uh, we're all pretty excited about what lays ahead of us. Step back a couple of years, uh, a lot of a lot of what... Uh what Dreadnought was was really about was theories, what you thought might be there, what you thought you could find. You've, you've done all the, the desktop work, but it was time to put the drill rigs in the ground. The, a great question here has come in, you know, did you, did you honestly think uh, two years ago or, or a bit more than two years ago now when you were listing uh, that you'd be where you are today? That's always the dream. You know, there's never a guarantee in exploration. It's one of the things we always like to say. Um, you know, we have to have the cricket season and footy season projects. We have three, four projects on the run. For every target we test, we want to be generating five new targets because there's a it's a very low 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 probability of success in exploration. So all we could do was our best. We built a team that uh, we've worked together a lot over the years. We knew what we wanted to achieve and we knew how we wanted to achieve that. And so to see the fruits of that labor, it's certainly something that we're very proud of as a team. Uh, you know, you won't see a a group more proud and, and, and making noise and things like that is, is probably the Dreadnought crew does. So uh, it's a very close-knit group, and we're very proud of what we've done. Uh, and we look forward to, to continue to deliver. So it's uh, it's been a lot of fun delivering the copper gold discoveries at, a, at in the Kimberley. You know, when we did that in, in 2021, where it was our main listing assets in 2019, you know, we pegged Mangaroon because there was no guarantee that we would have success in the Kimberley. 
And so to not only deliver that success and that those discoveries in the Kimberley, and then deliver a number of discoveries uh, at Mangaroon at the same time is, uh, is very exciting. So we look forward to continuing to do that across the board. So Mangaroon was your safety? That was right. It was, the, it, was, it was pegged as a replacement for the Kimberley in case the Kimberley fell over. That's right. And, and another question has come through in, in relation to that is, so how do, you now, how do you now turn your attention or make sure your attention, you've got two quality assets, um, one that, as you said, was, you know, if it didn't come up, we've now got another to look at, but you've now got two quality assets. How do you, how do you divide your attention and, uh, and make sure they're both resourced adequately? The quality of the targets always determine the best things that they're going to get funded. So we advance our projects, you know, to go out there and put a drill hole into something costs X, to put a resource on something costs 3X, and to, and to generate a target costs very, very little. So we advance our projects, we give ourselves lots of options, and we look at and focus on what's going to give us uh, the best return, what's the best, most attractive targets, and what can we deliver on resources. So right now, the rare earths have priority because the rare earths are, are quite critical, uh, pun intended. And you also have, uh, we have a very quick opportunity to deliver these resources and turnarounds on them within the timeframes that we have available. What we're doing now on the rare earths, we hope to be doing in the Kimberley next year on the copper gold discoveries. So prove up that scale, deliver those resources, and deliver that scope and study. But in the background, we got a team. I think there's <laughs> there's 12, 12 geos now, I believe, at Dreadnought. Um, we have a, a very active team. All of us have worked together multiple times, multiple companies over the past. We know how we operate. And so each project is well looked after, and they're continuing to generate targets, and they compete with each other to see which ones are going to get the funding. Now, I've got a really good questions come through in terms of cabanonite, cabanatite, sorry. Yes, cabanatite. Uh, cabanatite. Yeah. <laughs> I've got to get it right one day. Um, what's the significance of that mineralization at Yin? The significance of mineralization at Yin? So, yeah. What's the, so the significance so, of that type of mineralization? So, so Yin, Yin's quite interesting. So the Yang Gabbana Ironstone Complex, which has been known about for, for quite some time uh, through Hastings' work and, and the companies before it, is that it's, uh, it has some of the highest NDPR trio ratios anywhere in the world. So when you look at, you know, you go back 30 years, uh, rare earths have always been something that, you know, when Mount Weld was first being looked at, you know, they were assessing Mount Weld because they needed cerium and lanthanum uh, for, and then for, for red phosphorus and, and polishing, and then Europium became a, a big thing. And it's really only on the back of the electrification, you know, they're seeing the rare earth magnets boom that we're seeing as we go to an electric sort of future, that nadium and praseodymium are making up the bulk of the value and focus on rare earths. But all rare earths tend to occur together in the mineralogy. And so you look at global rare earth demand now, nadium and praseodymium make up between 30 and 40% of that. And by 2040, 2050, it's going to be 40 to 50% of rare earth demand is going to be made up of neodymium and praseodymium. But most global deposits, the mineralogy only has 15 to 20% neodymium and praseodymium in that. And so in order to meet the neodymium and praseodymium demand, you're going to have to double and triple production of the other rare earth elements that are less attractive and it's going to flood the market in that. And so by having a region that has some of the highest NDPR trio ratios anywhere in the world, the quality and attractiveness of that con. If you're running a processing uh, refinery, you're going to want to be putting through the, the, the con that gives you the most of the metals that you want per, per unit of con. And so it's, it's a very attractive uh, viewpoint from that. And that's why from day one, when we put our first drill hole in, we had people approaching us for optics. So, you know, again, that second mover advantage, it's very useful for us, uh, not only because it allowed us to produce a con very early, but because a lot of marketing and familiarity with that concentrates already out there in the market. The carbonatites are slightly different. So the ironstones are these sort of late stage sites that, that shoot out. Globally, there's really only one or two other places where those occur in any sort of economic sense, that's Finn and Norway. Uh, generally, the intrusions, the, the actual source intrusions like we have at C1, C5, that's where the bulk of the mineralization is. That's your classic Mount Weld, Arasha, um, you know, uh, Nagwala or Mountain Pass or anything else like that. Those are your sort of source intrusions. You get a range of mineralization in that. That's more classic bread and butter sort of style. And as we get through that, so we'll find zones within those carbonatites that hopefully have high grade niobium, high grade rare earths, phosphate, whatever else those things produce. And, uh, and we'll assess from there. It's a lot of opportunity. 
the significance of carbonatites, I guess, from talking about uh, the uh, you know exploration success, there are no guarantees. I think studies historically have shown there's a one in 10,000 chance of a, of a prospect becoming a mine. And when it comes to carbonatites globally, it's about one in 10. So they're, they're very attractive uh, you know, rocks to have. They're very unique rocks. They're, they're, they're very funky. They're stunning to look at. They're confusing. They're fantastic. Um, but they, they tend to be quite economic. Great answer. Um, last question. There's been a, a big push by Western governments to that we've seen in recent years to, to really uh, support, enhance, uh, and, and be part of the development of critical minerals. Um, is that generating further interest from in your in in particular in your projects um, around not just investor interest but offtake interest, um, partner interest, all of those sort of things? Yes, and I think there, there's two there's two things really underpinning the the attractive the the attention in rare earths and the critical metals. One of which is the overall desire uh, to go to electrification, and that requires the magnets, that requires the rare earths. We're seeing that increase in attractiveness in lithium. You're seeing that in rare earths falling right behind in lithium's footsteps. But then there's a second one, and that's a, a supply chain issue, and that's the more strategic, and that's the U.S. versus China. You know, if you look at, or, or Western world first China, wherever you want to review that uh, appropriately, um, and that's creating a sort of a different dynamic within that. If you look at the capacity of creating magnets in China, there's already enough capacity to make magnets to supply the world's demand up to 2050. And so what you're seeing is there's going to be a demand to decarbonize the world, but then parallel to that is a demand to build up that supply chain ex-China. And so as, a, as the new, new kid on the block, if you will, with no offtakes or any sort of legacy issues sitting in there, uh, we do have a bit more flexibility to look at where we send our concentrate and to work collaboratively with midstream, downstream, or mining processors to come up with something that is aligned with those political interests. Right. Well, thanks, Dean, for uh, such a thorough presentation. Such Thanks for driving such a long way to be here. Um, <laughs> Dreadnought Resources, clearly a company to watch. If it's not on your watch list, uh, maybe it should be. So, Dean, thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. Next up, we have Tony Rivera, Managing Director of Azure Minerals, ASX code AZS. Azure has an accelerated growth strategy to rapidly advance the company's multi-commodity opportunity at Andover in Western Australia, with a major focus, as the slide suggests, being on the lithium potential while still progressing the nickel sulfide project through exploration and development studies. Thanks, Tony. Over to you. Thanks, David, and it's a real pleasure to be able to talk today about the Azure Minerals story that is unfolding at uh, Andover Project. Andover is located in the West Pilbara region of Western Australia, and, and the photograph here on the first slide shows that it's uh, a very, very uh, in really good place to be operating on. So we've got rolling hills, not much way in vegetation, lots of outcrops sticking out of the ground, good uh, access in there. You can see a road in the middle background through there. So this is a... Uh, a, a pretty typical photograph of our Andover project area. Uh, next slide, please. So let's uh, have a quick corporate snapshot. We've got about 390 million shares on issue, um, and we've got a market cap today around that $640 million, maybe a little bit higher than that. Uh, so the company's come a long way in the last eight months uh, from a market cap of about 70 million at the beginning of the year to now nearly 10 times that. So there's been a, certainly a very positive reaction to our lithium discoveries. Um, cash on hand at the moment is about 18 million in the bank with no debt. So the company's in a very secure place financially. Importantly, in terms of our shareholders, uh, is having SQM as the largest shareholder on our register. SQM is the Chilean company, which is the uh, second largest lithium producer in the world. Uh, it's currently building the Mount Holland uh, lithium mine and processing facility and, and refinery in joint venture with West Farmers in, in southern part of Western Australia. So SQM came on board about six months ago and uh, reached out to us. They um, made an offer to take nearly 20% of the company for a $20 million investment because they really liked what they could see in terms of the lithium potential on the Andover project. So that was a huge endorsement for the project at a very early stage when we actually didn't have any drill holes into the pegmatites which host the lithium. And since then, obviously, their, their foresight has proven to be very uh, accurate and uh, we've, we've come a very long way. 
Um, the Andover project is a joint venture. It's 60% uh, owned by Azure and 40% is owned by the legendary prospector Mark Creasy and his group. So that 60-40 joint venture is the uh, the dynamic that we, we uh, are going forward with because Creasy's 40% is free carried through to the decision to mine. Uh, next slide, please. So we're talking about lithium and that's what we are here today about. So move on to the next slide, please. The location of the project. You couldn't get a better located project. I know Dean was talking about driving 14 or 15 hours to come back from his project uh, up there in the middle of uh, the back of beyond. Whereas here for Azure, we fly from Perth to Caratha, that's a two hour plane flight. And then there's a half an hour's drive along the Northwest Coastal Highway, which takes us through the town of Roeburn and then into the Northern part of the project area. From there, we've got a lot of roads and tracks that spread out throughout the project area. So access into Andover is really good. And then we look at uh, the other infrastructure facilities that are in the area. So we've got a potable water pipeline that crosses the project area. We've got a high voltage power line. We've got a gas pipeline, all of which are available for commercial third party use. And uh, in addition to that, you've got the Port of Dampier, which is located just on the left-hand side of that aerial photograph. It's a, it's a commercial multi-user port available for import and export of, of, uh, of cargoes. To the south of us, uh, off the screen, you've got Rio Tinto's iron ore mining operations. There's one of their railway lines that runs up our western side of our tenement up to the Cape Lambert for the exporting of their iron ore. And offshore, you've got... Uh, the uh, West, I'm um, sorry, uh, Chevron and Woodside's uh, oil and gas production facilities. And then their LNG on is processing facilities are onshore on the Burrup Peninsula. So this is a really infrastructure rich area. It's heavily industrialized. And yet we have a 108 square kilometer mining tenement there, which uh, upon which we're finding uh, abundant amounts of lithium. So you could not get a better located uh, project for both exploration and for mining. Next slide, please. So we zoom in on the project area. Andover's made up of three exploration licenses, which are sh shown outlined in blue there. We've got the town of Roeburn, a couple of kilometers to the north of the project area. Then you can see the Northwest Coastal Highway going through the uh, northeastern part of the tenement. The red shapes that you can see on this image are the outcropping pegmatites that we've mapped and sampled. And you can see there's hundreds and hundreds of them actually outcropping. Uh, individually, there's over 700. A lot of those do join up together. Um, what we're finding in the area is that there is an abundant outcrop. Um, and so identifying these outcropping pegmatites has been uh, relatively straightforward. Um, have the next slide, please. So we're looking at uh, an area here that peg contains the pegmatite swarm of about nine kilometres in an east-west direction by up to five kilometres in a north-south direction on the on the eastern side. Um, those pegmatites in there individually can be up to two kilometres long, maybe up to 100 to 200 metres wide at surface. And the surface sampling that we carried out in that area over most of last year in the early part of this year, um, with over a thousand rock chip samples collected, showed evidence of widespread high-grade lithium mineralisation that was contained within these outcropping pegmatites. And in those outcrops, you can see abundant spodumene mineral, There's, and spodumene is the preferred lithium mineral for, uh, for extraction and processing. Um, some of the uh, very high-grade samples you can see on the left-hand side there were over 30, 35 samples were over 4%. Um, a large number of two, three, four, up to 5% uh, lithium grades in outcrops. So it's some, one of the, uh, the highest grade, if not the highest grade lithium outcrops that has been discovered in Western Australia. Next slide, please. So the area where we're currently drilling is called designated target area one. There's a number of pegmatites in there, four or five of them that uh, we're currently drilling. The reason we started drilling in this particular location is because that was the only area in which we had environmental and heritage approval in place in which we were able to go and access with drill rigs to go and drill test those pegmatites. We did have a lot, all of our heritage and environmental approvals in place for the western side, the left-hand side of the project area. That's where we were previously exploring for our nickel and copper sulphide mineralization. But the eastern area was, an, it was a new area, so we needed to get those environmental and heritage approvals in place. The first of those is in that target area number one, and that's where we're currently drilling. Next slide, please. 
So we zoom in on this, uh, this target area number one, multiple pegmatites sitting in there. The bright red zones are the outcropping pegmatites which stand boldly out of the out of the surrounding host rocks, which are usually mafic or ultramafics. And then you've surrounding those, you've got that uh, paler red shaded, which shows um, evidence of the continuity of the mineralization. And that uh, continuity is both demonstrated from the surface mapping and sampling, where we can see minor outcrop and subcrop there of the pegmatites, and also the drill holes that we've put into there show evidence of that continuity uh, of the mineralization, both a long strike from southwest to northeast, but also up and down dip as well. The blue lines that you can see on there are the drill holes that uh, we've completed, the diamond drill holes that we've completed to date. Um, we've drilled about 30 holes into this particular area for about 10,000 metres. We probably have another 10 to 15 diamond drill holes to go just into this area alone. And we've also commenced a reverse circulation program uh, a couple of months ago, so that's underway. Over 20 holes have been completed to date out of a total of 100 that we've got planned in this area. You can see that the, the fence lines, the, the, uh, the drill lines that we put in there are about 200 metres apart with 50 metre spaced holes along those lines. The intention is to be able to drill this area out to a, a, a jork resource status um, which should be uh, available or completed by the first quarter of next year. What we're seeing with these con the continuous pegmatites here is uh, strike lengths in excess of a kilometre long confirmed by drilling in an area where the outcrop evidence is over 2.2 kilometres in strike. So there's significant uh, lateral continuity here. And the pegmatites are stacked one on top of each other, dipping towards the northwest. And true widths of the pegmatites in a lot of places are well over 100 metres. Um, and within that, we are getting uh, true widths of lithium mineralization up to about 100 meters as well. We'll have the next slide, please. And some of the drill holes results we're getting back are just, as it says, they're quite exceptional. Um, we're getting very broad widths of mineralization in some holes up to 100 meters wide. Uh, nearly true width widths as well. A very high grades of lithium, and there's abundant. Uh, intersections where we've got 40, 50, 60 metre wide zones of mineralisation. So this is some of the widest or broadest uh, mineralised uh, zones of mineralisation that have been identified in Western Australia, certainly in early stages of previous uh, other companies' lithium exploration. And also what we're seeing in there are some very high grades as well. So for example, that whole 208 where we've got 22 metres at three and a half percent lithium, that is one of the, the best highest grade lithium intersections that I know of in Western Australia. So the diamond drilling is continuing and uh, there will be more results coming out very shortly um, from, the, uh, from the results that are coming in now. Um, the RC drilling is continuing as well. So there'll be in, uh, a lot of information being released about those results as well. We'll have the next slide, please. When you're looking at the uh, the drill core, what's really important that we can we have determined is that we can identify the spodumene visually. Now, the spodumene in these photographs are the pale grey to white crystals that you can see in those four pieces of drill core, and that's fairly typical of the very high grade mineralization that we see in the in the drill core. So you're getting three to four up to five percent lithium in these samples, and the background. Uh, host rock is grey quartz. So where we see the uh, high grade mineralization, it's usually just spodumene and grey quartz. And then as the grades get lower, you have other minerals that come in like uh, feldspars, etc. Um, what is very important for us is that we're able to identify the um, the amount or the or the or the an estimated volume of spodumene within that drill core. And that gives us a very strong indication of what the grades are likely to be in those pieces, the, those drill core and that drill holes. And from there on, we can actually plan and execute our drilling program two to three weeks in advance of receiving the assays back in with confidence that we're actually continuing to hit mineralization with the drilling. We'll have the next slide, please. So where to from here? Well, one of the most important uh, items that we, we need to address at all times is both the, the heritage and also the environmental side of things. Um, we're in an area which is has cultural significance to the local traditional owners, so we need to be very careful of how, how we operate there. So we can't just go out and drill holes. We need to undertake uh, 
heritage surveys and have clearances put in place so that we can actually go out there and drill. So the two areas where we've currently just completed heritage surveys are shown there as those white boxes, target areas number two and three. Both of them have uh, at least three or four large pegmatites in there, which extend over kilometres in, in strike length and up to 100 to 200 metres wide at surface. And they also contain uh, or have returned very high grades of lithium from the surface rock chip sampling in the order of three to up to 5% lithium. So both areas, target area two and target area three, are the new areas which we'll be starting our drilling on in the, uh, in the very near future. As I said, we have completed our heritage surveys in them. We are just awaiting final clearances to be able to put the rigs into those areas. So those areas together with the target area currently drilling in uh, target area one, uh, the ones, the targets that will make up the, uh, the targets for our mineral resource estimate, which is expected in the first quarter of next year. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so where to from here for the rest of this year? Well, we are probably 30,000 metres into a 100,000 metre drilling program. We started the diamond drilling back in March with two rigs, and then we had two RC rigs move to site in May. We've got another RC rig drilling there now, and a, th and a third diamond drill rig is on its way as well. This is one of the largest drilling programs that's been undertaken for lithium in Western Australia that I'm aware of. Um, and we're only undertaking that because we have the utmost confidence that we will be able to identify a, a, a lithium resource there that will be of world-class scale. We intend to be able to put out a, an exploration target in the current quarter, uh, once we have a little bit more information back from both the drilling and from the assaying. And the mineral resource estimate, the maiden resource estimate, will be published in the first quarter of next year. At least that is our objective. We also have quite a few other pegmatite targets which have yet to be tested. Um, there's another 17 on the project area where we have really good outcrop uh, with containing significant amounts of spodumene and also returning high grades of lithium from that uh, sampling. So there's a lot more areas yet to go and drill. Um, we've also started some of the component studies of what will be the initial scoping study for the, the maiden mineral resource estimate out next year. So metallurgical test work is currently in progress. Um, heritage surveys are always ongoing. Environmental baseline studies are continuing as well. They've been underway for the last couple of years. We commenced those as part of the nickel exploration project two years ago. So those environmental baseline studies are going through their final year. Um, and also we've got uh, some uh, new licenses we've applied for to search for groundwater and hydrological studies will be taking place as well. So the intention there is that um, we want to be able to, as part of the exploration target, um, identify that the project does hold potential for hosting over 100 million tonnes of lithium resources. And if it does prove to be true that that, resource, that uh, project does contain that sort of resource, then this will put it into the top 10 in the world and potentially much higher up the ladder than that. Have the next slide, please. So that's the, uh, the Azure Mineral Story in the Andover project, it's certainly proven to be highly exciting, first with two nickel sulphide deposits discovered, which we've not really talked about today at all, and also now the, uh, the lithium that we're drilling out, which looks like it could be a, a lithium project of world class and world scale. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Great presentation and clearly a project that has captured the market's attention and, and looking at the number of questions that we've received, um, certainly a company that is on a lot of watch lists and that's uh, to be expected given the, the scale and opportunity to do to uh, associated with the lithium asset. Um, I just want to go back a little bit in time. So Mark Creasy, um, probably uh, for those who know of Mark, he's probably one of the, the most well-credentialed um, exploration geologist going around and, and, a, and a, a famous pegger of projects and a deliverer of projects. How hard was it to prize this project off, Mark? Um, and and now, um, how it wasn't in, very difficult. Interested? <laughs> Go on. Sorry, now how interested in, in is he in the exploration work being undertaken? All right. 
Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, got you. Okay, sorry, I, I got the first part of your question. Um, in terms of pricing this project from, um, from Mark Creasy, it wasn't actually very difficult because our previous uh, existence of exploring in Mexico, uh, we came back to Western Australia. This is in early 2020. I approached Mark to see if he had any projects that he would consider vending into Azure. And he straight away said, yes, I have a really great nickel project called Andover located in the, in the Pilbara. Um, so we actually entered this project on the basis of the nickel potential and we successfully found two nickel deposits. But who would have known that uh, also on the project area, we had hundreds and hundreds of outcropping lithium rich pegmatites. And the second part of the question is, how active is he, given he is he's a rock kicker? He's a genuine rock kicker, and he loves kicking rocks and finding projects and, and developing projects. How active is he or interested in he, is he in the work that's being done from an exploration point of view? He's not active in any way now, but he's certainly very interested, and uh, we, we keep him well informed about what's going on. He, you're right, he, he's an explorer at heart. He loves making discoveries or being involved when discoveries are made. So we 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 make sure that we keep him uh, well informed about what's going on, and uh, he he's excited just as we are. Uh, SQM, um, you touched on them. Clearly, one of the biggest uh, lithium companies globally. What uh, what how how was it? How were you able to attract them at such an early stage into this project? Did they see the potential that you saw that early? They approached us on the back of the initial rock chip samples. Uh, we didn't reach out to them. They called me on the morning of our putting out a press release saying that we had some rock chip samples with some uh, lithium grades above 1% in it. Um, so then they asked for a if they could have a look at the data and have a look at the project and we signed a confidentiality agreement, they they came to site with two of their geologists, two of our geologists, and they hired a helicopter fly around for a day. And they came back and within a week, they prop, put a proposition to us that uh, that they would like to take uh, a share of the company in order to be, gain exposure to the project. And they obviously saw something at Andover that they really liked. And uh, now we understand why. In terms of funding, a very, very aggressive program. What's the funds look like and, and how far do they, they last in terms of uh, exploration spending? Yeah, we've got about $18 million in the bank at the moment and we're currently spending um, 3 to $4 million a month. So, you know, you can work the maths out on that. So there will come a time sometime in the next few months where we'll need to go back to the market and raise some funding. But at the moment, we're... We are well cashed up. We are drilling with multiple drill rigs. We're returning some amazing results and, and that we expect those amazing results to continue um, out, out into the future. So we would like to see the um, project develop just a little bit further before we go back to the market. Um, a great question here. You touched on the fact that the first area you drilled was really the only area you could drill. Um, and, and, you know, because of a, a number of reasons in relation to access, and now you're gaining greater access. In hindsight, was it your preferred drill location? Or do, now that you look at the, the total project area, are there other spots that are more exciting? There were a couple of other areas that initially were higher priority for us, but we were unable to gain access to them at that point in time. So we ended up going into what we call target area one or where the AP 10, 11, 12 pegmatites outcrop. Um, that was that's in, that was back then, but now where we're drilling currently, it's an absolute cracker, and uh, and it should have been right at the top of the table along with the other ones that we identified. But the two new areas that we've got, um, we've just completed the heritage clearance surveys on, and we hope to be drilling in those in the next few weeks. Um, those two are really high priority as well because there's, there's a large amount of pegmatites outcropping the, and contain spodumin at surface returning high grades of lithium. So it's quite likely or possible that uh, when we go and drill in those two new areas, we'll find similar volumes of mineralization as we're currently doing. Now, uh, management and boards don't like talking themselves up too much. Um, and in, certainly in your case, in the Azure case, you're a, you're a, a, a pragmatic and conservative board and albeit have big smiles on your face whenever we talk about exploration and results. Um, 
the, the, the team itself has strong capacity in building projects. And in particular, uh, you've developed and built projects historically, so you know what needs to be done. Well, that's true. Yes, we, we have people on the board who are uh, either personally or represent um, other uh, major shareholders who uh, have good experience in terms of um, discovery, development, um, building projects. And yes, I was involved with something similar back in the uh, early days with Jubilee Mines when we developed the Cosmos nickel mine. Um, and I would say that uh, you know, with our nickel deposits that we've got at Andover, they would be a joy to actually develop those ones. Um, the lithium is proving to be something that is uh, several orders of magnitude much larger. So that's going to be an interesting conundrum when it comes to uh, to the development and uh, for, further uh, development of that particular side of the Andover project. Tony, a cracking story, clearly on a lot of watch lists, looking at the number of uh, questions and comments coming through. A number of them are just purely congratulatory and wishing uh, the company and yourself all the best going forward. So uh, take those while you can and when you can. Um, appreciate yep. the opportunity to hear the Azure story. Tony, we will follow with interest. Thanks for your time. Thanks, David. It's a pleasure. I'd now like to introduce Aaron Ravel, CEO and Managing Director of Pursuit Minerals, ASX code PUR. Pursuit is focused on platinum group elements, nickel, copper, gold in Australia, and lithium projects in Argentina, two world-class mining jurisdictions. I would like to thank Aaron for getting up very, very early in Europe uh, to take this call and present to you today. Uh, Aaron, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning to all. Uh I'm not sure if we can just run through to the to the introductory slide, but thanks for having us. Um, as State of Pursuit Minerals is a uh, more lithium focused uh, developer, um, where we are heavily focused on our Rio Grande Sur project and and really building a top tier lithium exploration and development company. Pursuit Minerals uh, really uh, ha has been a new entrant in in lithium, having only completed the acquisition of this project. Uh, which was announced in December and then finally completed in March at the start of the year. So relatively um, earlier in, in our in our stages, but still relatively well advanced. Um, the company is really focused on the solar on this project on the Rio Grande Solar through a combination of, of factors. Um, we already sit uh, the project already sits within an existing NI forty three one hundred one resource of two point one million tons. Uh, we've also got some quite active neighbours who have had some recent drilling success uh, up to with brine grades discovered from 800 to 950 MGLI, which are some of the highest grades in in, in uh, Argentina and getting quite close to some high, highest of uh, grades in Latin America. Additionally, along with the exploration, we're, we're very focused on progressing our production scenario, which we've done through optioning a 100 tonne lithium carbonate pilot plant that we're in the process of completing that acquisition. We also have a very highly experienced board and, and management team. Um, so if you can flick to the next slide, please. Just a bit of a corporate snapshot here. We're currently capitalized, uh, we're at the, the start of July at about 38.8 million, uh, just a little over 3 million of cash in, in the bank and our board comprising of, of Peter Wall, uh, quite well known uh, in, in the resources space, uh, a highly effective resources lawyer. Uh, Mark Freeman, who, who along with Pete, were, were part of the uh, yeah, structuring of, of and acquiring our lithium uh, deal. Uh, myself and then Mr. Tom Eady, um, who is quite well known in the, in the resources space, um, very well known for his time as chairman of Syro Resources, which he was uh, a founder of at a 15 mil market cap. And then in the graphite space, took that over to a 1 billion market capitalization. So just going up to the next slide, please. Along with the board, we're also joined with um, Alejandro, who is our in-country manager. Alejandro is a very uh, well-experienced lithium professional, having previously worked with Rincon Lithium uh, in the development of uh, their operation prior to its sale to Rio Tinto up on the Rincon Solar. Uh, very fortunate that he's also an Australian uh, Argentinian dual citizen and works quite close with me in dealing with a lot of the in-country issues. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a small snapshot on, on where we are. Um, the Rio Grande Sur project is located in the Lithium Triangle, which is the, the triangle comprising of Bolivia, Chile, and, and Argentina. 
um, the, it's home to to fifty percent of the world's uh, lithium resources. Uh, comprise with a, with a lot of those uh, um, now under exploration and development with with major companies showing significant interest. Uh, Argentina um, has elevated its status in the last decade now with the third largest lithium producer uh, behind Australia and Chile. Um, and has the largest significant pipeline of, of new mines and projects in development in the Latin America region. Uh, next slide, please. Looking specifically at Argentina, there it, it's it's a very uh, unique uh, situation at the moment within the triangle. Um, in the last five years, we've seen a lot of consolidation in a very limited number of, of, of areas. So the supply of, of real estate within the, the 16 Salars, which we've labeled there on, on the slide, uh, is coming becoming quite rare. So with pursuit and this opportunity that we've been able to, to put together, uh, the transactions uh, will, will become increasingly harder in terms of finding quality projects. Um, 17 Salars exist uh, within Argentina. There's a few smaller salt lakes um, which, are, which are not included, but of the main Salars, we're seeing a lot of consolidation in the space. Um, most notably, uh, Hombre Muerto um, has been very active with the merger of Livent and Alchem, effectively consolidating that Salar. We've also seen recently in the last couple of years, Pastos Grandes, uh, which has been heavily consolidated now by Lithium Americas. So we're expecting these trends to move forward, uh, especially within Argentina, which is very quickly becoming a tier one address. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, looking at the lithium market, there's a lot of talk uh, around where the, the supply uh, is going to come from to meet demand. Uh, lithium in itself is in a structural deficit. A lot of focus is on is on the spot price, which has rebounded from that 20,000 per tonne mark earlier in the year, increasing back up to the 44,000 per tonne mark over the last month. Um, but the realities of, of these projects now is lithium is is a lot more understood has as over the last decade um, and these projects are uh, not without their challenges both hard rock and brine in terms of actually bringing them on into supply so the the demand in terms of the with especially driven by the ev sector is really pushing for new sources required to actually bring on a new supply for long-term contracts to to meet the forecasted demand next slide please a pursuit we're seeing really three main drivers uh, behind uh, uh, that demand. And and, a, and there's a real uh, talk uh, and having it just recently attended the Fast Markets Lithium Conference in, in Vegas in the past couple of weeks, where a lot of industry players met. Um, a lot of consistent themes are coming out, really driven by three main factors. Um, the first being the price strength, which is mentioned, you know, we saw um, uh, the price rebound from the low 20,000 per tonne mark up to uh, the 44,000 per tonne, really signaling that there was a, almost a price floor indicated. Um, on top of that, uh, the Chilean nationalisation issue um, has been talked about a lot now, where um, Chile has announced they intend to take a 51% stake uh, in, in projects of a strategic nature. Um, so questions really remain over the hard or soft nationalization and the threat to supply that, that could come um, with uh, the, the remnants and, and, rem and memories of, of the 70s with, with uh, Coldeco being born out of the nationalization of the Chilean copper mines. And then on, on top of that, now we're really starting to see that the lithium market is becoming too big to ignore, um, especially from the majors. Uh, if you compare Vale's uh, critical, or sorry, um, precious metals units, uh, EBITDA in 2022, um, at a total EBITDA of about half a billion dollars, uh, comparatively, you've got um, the three majors uh, being R SQM, Arbomail, and what is the, the proposed uh, Alchem Livent merger having a, an EBITDA of, of a billion. So for the majors now, we're starting to see a lot of activity um, in terms of uh, where Rio Tinto purchased the Rincon mine. Uh, that was a, 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 a sort of a signal of, of major entrance into the space where the space is effectively becoming too big to ignore. Uh, next slide, please. Slide, please. So a quick overview of, of our asset here at, at Rio Grande. Uh, we have a, a just under 10,000 hectare position uh, on the Rio Grande Salar. That's uh, about 50 to 100 kilometres to the west of the Hombre Muerto Salar in the space. Um, the Salar in, in itself, uh, as mentioned, has 
a existing NI43 101 resource of 2.1 million tonnes at 380 to 375 MGLI. Uh, when we were putting this, this uh, project together, it was um, a bit more advanced in terms of the exploration. We weren't on, on a greenfield solar where there was no resource. So for us, it was um, a, a very uh, key part of putting this project together where I, instead of looking and, and, and exploring for potentially lithium, we know there's lithium there. It's more of a quantification of how much. The resource in itself has only been drilled to about 100 metres uh, below the, the surface. Uh, so as we're seeing now with with uh, some other companies that are drilling adjacent to, or, or where we intend to drill, uh, who are drilling down to that five, 600 metre level, um, we're seeing two things, which is the lithium is, is continuing uh, to, to depth, which is expected uh, across a few of the solars with very similar geology for, for some of, of the, of the neighbouring solars. Uh, and also importantly, the grade. Um, for us, uh, it was really positive to see a, a neighbouring company achieve grades uh, of averaging that 800 MGLI, um, but importantly going to that 950 MGLI intersection, which was about two kilometres to the west of our Mitho tenement, which is the large tenement in the north there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as mentioned, this is the NI43 101 resource. Um, as you can see, it, it does start to increase with some of that red grade. Um, and this resource was done through two parts of, of exploration. One was in 2011 uh, through a previous owner and then LSC Lithium in 2018. Next slide, please. For us, these two maps were very key in when we put the, the project together. Um, as mentioned, the Rio Grande Solar is, has been quite heavily explored. Um, there on the left side, you can see the drill cores uh, or previous drilling, of which some are very close in proximity and even on our uh, tenement position there. Um, in terms of the strike, it's about a 10 to 15 K uh, east to west across and about 20 to 25 Ks north to south. Um, so a lot of historical information where significant drill grades had been um, uh, intercepted in that 400 MGLI. Comparatively, that's uh, at a base grade very similar to the Rincon Solar, which is where Argosy, uh, ASX AGY are currently developing their projects and, and Rincon, are, um, they, sorry, the Rio Tinto also developing the Rincon project. Um, in terms of, of coverage, there's been quite few drill cores, as, as can see, and the drilling uh, along with the CSAMT previously identified um, two key depositional centres, which hosted a lot of the, the lithium um, resource, which for us, we're very fortunate that our tenements sit within those depos depositional centres. So from an exploration standpoint, it's not a greenfield exploration. Um, this is more of a, a quantification exercise of knowing that there is lithium there, um, but identifying how much of that resource resources is on our, our tenement position. Next slide, please. Again, some of the, the historical exploration through the previous CSAMT survey, um, these, tr these cross sections are an east-west uh, viewpoint um, from a north-south trend line. Um, again, you can, with the red borders, you can actually see the, the brine floating between um, our tenement boundaries. Um, we were very fortunate, again, with the prior drilling. So uh, within our main tenement, which is subject to an exploration program of, of our own drilling at the back half of this year, um, we were, there were some really promising grades of that 395 to 391 um, on that tenement. Uh, and then also a, a twin core came with 361 MGLI. So for us, we intend to, to drill um, quite significantly deeper, aiming between that 400 to 600 metre when we do our, our maiden drilling program later in the year. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, we um, we we have our Mito tenement on the northern side, which ha has very similar um, geological characteristics to where currently Galan is drilling on its Hombre Muerto West project. Um, this project is not on the oh, sorry, this tenement isn't on the solar surface, but there are strong indications from uh, adjacent drilling that the alluvial plain extends underneath the andrusites and breccias where brine is present. Um, as mentioned, the uh, an adjacent company where you can see on that red uh, circle, um, they were drilling to a depth of 600 metres and found significant brine intercepts, um, including up to grades of 950 MGLI. So for us, when we come to drill this tenement, whilst it was originally um, per, uh, purchased for infrastructure purposes, where we have space to 
position a plant uh, and build evaporation ponds. Um, this uh, tenement in itself um, does have some exploration upside potential as well. Next slide, please. And some these are some of the adjacent geological examples of uh, of that project. As mentioned, Golan lithium in the, in the side there. Um, Arena Minerals um, had a very similar uh, event where they weren't drilling on the main uh, part of Paslos Grandes and found uh, lithium, uh, quite significant lithium to, to significant depth, you know, 641 in July at 620 metres to, to depth. So for us, the upside potential is, is clearly evident in the, in the Mito tenement when we look to drill that. Um, not in our initial campaign. Our initial drilling campaign will focus on the solar tenements, but we'll look to drill that uh, towards the end of, or sorry, the, this, the first half of, of 2024. Next slide, please. As mentioned, a, a key component alongside the, the exploration for us was also is the uh, development of the lithium carbonate that we're looking to produce from, from this pilot plant. Um, we optioned this pilot plant for, for acquisition that we're currently in the final stages of our due diligence and hopefully uh, set to acquire um, within the coming months. Um, this plant has a name ca capacity of 100 to 120 tonnes per annum, um, very similar to AGY when they started their uh, operation um, about uh, 2018, 2017. Um, if you go back through and look at the journey of some of our peers, um, many have started with a 100 ton plant and then moved that to um, either a 2000 ton plant, which is in the, the um, which uh, Argosy did, uh, or in the case of Oracobra now Elchem, they went from a, a smaller pilot plant right to that 20,000 ton scenario. So for us, um, this is a, a very key plant where, where uh, we aim to really focus on the production piece. Um, whilst the resource piece is obviously uh, very critical, um, for us, uh, the real value driver of this project is the ability to actually produce the lithium carbonate. Um, for us, we've been working quite heavily with some um, tier one consultants who have worked extensively in the Puna on, on the development of various brines and, and the processing options. Um, so for us, this plant um, the intention is to actually have brine running through that with, throughout the course of this year, um, where we will have uh, from our, our pumping wells or intended pumping wells at site, we'll be trucking brine down from the Salar into, the, into this plant upon completion of its, of its pending acquisition. Uh, so this plant is a real value driver uh, in the terms of actually being able to produce lithium. Um, lithium projects uh, are quite abundant on, on both the hard rock and uh, the brine side. Um, however, for us, we really see the value and the key differentiator in the production piece, which is some, which has been a key focus for us. Next slide, please. So currently at the moment, um, our work streams are uh, headlined and we're actually about to set to complete our TEM and CSAMT survey. Um, the TEM, um, having already looked at some of the pre preliminary res results, which we should be uh, uh, announced to the market in due course, um, the preliminary field works are very consistent with what we've seen in the, in the historical um, exploration. Um, and, and I've identified some really solid drill targets, which we intend to undertake at the back half of this year. Um, the CSAMT uh, is currently ongoing um, at, up at the Mito tenement there. So for us, we've been quite excited and, and looking forward to the next uh, uh, stage, which is on, upon completion of the TEM and CSAMT to commence the drill program, which uh, we're currently in the final stages of the environmental permits required for that uh, workflow and, and work program. Next slide, please. So looking at our go forward plan, uh, it's quite an aggressive series of, of, of events. Um, however, we're very well positioned uh, to meet these deadlines and very fortunate that there's been um, significant prior exploration uh, on the Salar, which allows us to move quite quickly and quite aggressively. Um, we're fo focused heavily on uh, the production piece from our pilot plant, but also looking at the pilot, uh, sorry, the commencement of our drilling campaign uh, with the target of defining a maiden jork resource uh, towards the end of, of this year. Um, upon completion of the pilot plant acquisition, um, our intention is to rapidly bring that back online. Uh, the plant in itself has prior, previously produced lithium carbonate from other Salars in the Puna. Uh, so for us, we have a technical team working on it, adjusting that block to the Rio Grande Salar, while simultaneously running the exploration program, which culminates in defining a, a maiden jork resource. Um, 
these events are what we see as the key value drivers, um, especially in the lithium thematic. Um, lithium in itself is is in a very intense structural deficit, um, especially with the push of, of EV um, manufacturers and the IRA legislation from Biden. There's some quite ambitious targets uh, which will require significant new uh, supply to come on. So for us, we feel we're very well placed to meet the demand response. Uh, especially as we progress the project quite rapidly and quickly, quickly throughout the rest of 2023. Next slide, and that's, I think, it from me. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, great presentation. As I said at the beginning, sometimes it's about uh, looking at your watch list, looking what other companies are doing and thinking, maybe I'll just put this stock on and see. Um, and certainly with, with a big news flow coming and a lot of work happening, Pursuit might just be that stock you want to put on the watch list. Now, we do have a number of questions. Um, the first one is in relation to uh, the Solars, as you mentioned, it's it's a busy part of the world and there's a lot going on. How much do you learn by what's happening around you? Mm, quite a lot, to be frank. Um, you know, we've seen the evolution of the Solars and Brine projects really since 2008 when Rincon and Oric Cobre burst onto the ASX. Um, you know, we're very fortunate that there is a lot of technical and top technical development within Argentina coming out of, of you know, some very well-known companies. Um, FMC Live End, um has been around since 1987 producing in Argentina. Um, so there is that opportunity in terms of, of project development to, to learn from others. Um, however, a lot of the major technical consultants are, um, you know, very well staffed with some very um key people that have worked on several projects. So there's a, a, a lot of experience and a lot of learnings that are coming from those around us as they progress their projects as well. From an education point of view, how much education is needed to explain the positive elements of brine production? Brine production, I think, is really goes back to the genesis of, of FMC. I mean, if you look at FMC Livent, they actually moved away from hard rock production to brine production in the 80s as it was cheaper, faster, um, considered more efficient uh, to feed their Bessemer City hydroxide plant. Um, I think brine has a, um, a, a very solid future uh, against the hard rock projects. Not that they don't have their place. I mean, Greenbushes has and always will be one of the most amazing ore bodies that you'll stumble across in Australia. But having said that, um, you know, the brine projects are on the lower cost, cost quarter. They are cheaper and easier to explore in terms of uh, for example, you're not drilling within a five metre spacing for a measured resource, you're using a pumping well, um, as brine is a dynamic resource. So I think from when investors really start to understand the nuances and the really fine detail, um, you, you can see why, um, you know, SQM, Arbamal, you know, the, the core of their lithium businesses being the largest producers of brine projects in, in the Atacama. Um, not without challenges. There is some geopolitical challenges naturally within Chile. Um, you know, the nationalization or, or, or the introduction of the nationalization legislation um, is something that a lot of people watch with concern. But at their fundamental level, the brine projects uh, are, are quite um, quite exciting. They have the chance for rapid development, um, especially given the, the uh, focus now of, of technology in terms of both conventional and DLE processing as well. Just touching on that rapid production, and and as you say, it, it the potential is there to to bring projects into production um, very quickly um, and very cost effectively. Is is it a bit of a race? Is uh, you know, and and you can be swept into that race. That the um, that as you said, that the brines are liquid, so they're not just all sitting in one spot. They do um, generally um, move around in a positive way. Um, is, is that the opportunity, being able to get to market as quick as possible? Absolutely. I think that in terms of if you look at the lithium market, you know, ma majority of lithium is sold on long-term contracts. Um, you know, the spot price presents a lot of um, interest, as you know, but it, it really accounts for a very small percentage of lithium sales. Um, if you look at the longer-term fundamentals required for the demand side, um, supply is needed, both hard rock and Brian projects need to come online. In fact, nearly all of them need to come online to meet these projected forecasts. Um, so from our perspective, as mentioned with our pilot plant, you know, we, we have significant interest from potential off-takers as there isn't many uh, 
plants that are actually coming online. Yes, there's a lot of exploration in the Pune there, and there's quite there's a, a few ASX companies, you know, at Rincon at, at in Hawassi, uh, Pasitos, you know, drilling. Um, there's obviously the DLA DLE piece, um, you know, and and you're either a believer or a non-believer. Um, for us, we're continuing with the conventional processing as we feel that's a right fit for where we intend to take the company. Um, and that's our first and 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 foremost priority in terms of the processing piece. However, DLE has its place. Um, it is likely inevitable that someone will crack that. Um, you know, Sun Resin in China has a 10,000 ton plant. Um, there's a few French firms that are, are moving quite rapidly with, again, scalable plants. So from that perspective, the, the production piece is probably the most valuable and, and does present a significant opportunity in the brine space. And uh, similarly to, to the questions I asked, um, certainly uh, Dean at Dreadnought, how much do your neighbours watch what you're doing? How, you know, while yes, you're a small company, and if I go back four or five years, Galan was a small company in its in its journey and, and it was building out its profile. Um, how closely do your neighbours watch what you do? And, and is there an, an analogy for you and potentially shareholders with what Galan and others have done? Oh, absolutely. I think that we're really looking to replicate the successes of, of our neighbours. Um, you know, you look at both the neighbours in terms of the bigger um, the bigger side. And in Argentina, there's a lot of m and activity from oil companies at the moment. You know, Plus Patrol purchased uh, LSC Lithium, uh, you know, and now you're seeing Tech Patrol looking to acquire a TSX company, Alpha Lithium, which has a spot on, on Hombre Muerto. Um, even within uh, the space, there is... A significant opportunity for that re-rate where you've seen, as you mentioned, Galan and both Argosy, you know, they've worked their projects up the project development. Argosy now, um, you know, obviously in the processes of its uh, 2000 ton plant in continuous production, the third producer on the ASX um, and Galan obviously defining in the 8 million ton resource. So for us, we're looking to capture both of those elements on the resource side, looking for a significant resource, but also the production piece. Um, you know, again, if you go back, uh, AGY was a 300, 350 mil market cap company when it started production from its 100 ton pilot plants. So for us, whilst we're small now, achieving those milestones allows us to, to walk the project up the value curve. And M&A in, in lithium is heavily active. Um, you know, we've seen the base rate of an EV for a, for a Solar, such as Pazuelos and Rincon, go for that 900 mil mark um, with both Gangfang acquiring Pazuelos and then Rio Tinto acquiring Rincon. So I think there's a lot of, of looking over the fence from a lot of people for various different reasons uh, in the in the Argentinian Puna. Uh, and that all comes down to the fact that there's such limited real estate, you know, deals like Pursuit Minerals um, and its acquisition of the Rio Grande project. Um, you know, finding on Solar, you know, prime tenements that that we have historical expiration, it'd be very, very difficult to do, say, within two, three years from now. The real estate will be exhausted. Um, you know, we've just seen consolidation through Live and Alchem in the space. Um, and I think personally, we'll see a lot more consolidation as there's only a limited number of projects. So, you know, and demand is heavily outweighing supply for, for these projects at, at this point in the market. And the million dollar question, well funded. We are at the moment, um, you know, but like everyone else, we we have a, enough cash in, in in the bank and and several million dollars that gets us through our exploration program. Um, you know, our burn rate um, allows us to get through these activities. But as, as a few of the others have said, um, we're likely to come back to the market in due course just to increase so we can continue adding value for shareholders. Um, you know, a lot of these programs, we're very fortunate that it's a, a little bit cheaper than a hard rock play. But having said that, we've got some exciting things that once we complete uh, our, our planned drill program and, and acquisition of the pilot plan that we'll want to continue doing as we walk the project up the value curve. Thanks, Aaron. A great presentation. Um, thank you for getting up early. The sun's starting to come out for you there in Europe. Um, but I do appreciate you getting up early and giving the uh, the presentation for Pursuit Minerals. Uh, if it's not on the watch list, maybe it should be uh, a well-funded, uh, clear plan, uh, great project locations, uh, and clearly in the right neighbourhood. So, Aaron, thanks for your time. Cheers. Thanks, David. As I said in my introduction, the purpose of this webinar series is to give you the opportunity to engage directly with companies that are on your watch list and to give you ideas of companies you might want to potentially add to your watch list so you can follow them in the future. Unfortunately, we were hoping to have John Wellborn from Phoenix Resources on today, 
but uh, in the background, we've been uh, moving things around significantly as he's been in a me meeting uh, with the minister for a number of hours now, and, and uh, that is obviously clearly important to him and the company. But we will look to get John on in the in the next uh, couple of weeks so that we can bring the Phoenix story to you. So apologies there, but we've had three absolutely cracking stories. Clearly, a number of these companies are on your watch list and or should be. So if there are... Uh, look at your watch list and let you know if there are any companies that are on there that you'd like us to uh, present to you moving forward, uh, or are there any on that you've been thinking about that you'd like to hear from? The, the contact details for Stuart are there on the screen. Uh, thank you to the presenters for making the time to present and for you for watching. We'll see you again in two weeks' time. Have a great day. Thank you.